Well, I'm Holly, for those of you who haven't met me before, and I seem to have kind of gone on a, a self-job creation scheme, becoming <laughs> the planet's lawyer and working out what new laws we can put in place to protect the Earth. Permaculture is really important to me as well. And in fact, a lot of what I do is guided by permaculture principles. I unwittingly, in fact, I didn't even know about permaculture until about a year ago, and then discovered that here there was something out there that was very much in alignment with what I'm putting into my own practice, on a personal level as well as on a political level. And it, it's, it's something that makes an awful lot of sense to me, not just permaculture, biodynamics as well. Uh, and I was, I was very honoured to speak at the permaculture conference in London, just back in June, and tap into uh, the world of permaculture. Because I, I really love people who are involved in permaculture. They are, for me, some of the most unreasonable people in the planet. <laughs> I really like that. You know, they, they are people who have absolutely refused to accept the norm. And I've stood up and said, you know, no, I'm changing this. I, I don't want to be eating food that's going to chemically pollute me. I, I don't want to be, you know, not only eating it, ingesting it, putting it into my body, but actually what comes out of my body is, is polluting again. So what goes into it goes out. And that's something that really resonates with me. With me. And when I was 16, I did something that I think really kind of shaped the way I was always going to go in life. Um, I punched my art teacher, <laughs> which everyone deemed to be thoroughly unreasonable. <laughs> um, and it took me many years to work out, but in fact I'm very glad that I did it. What I realise now is that the art teacher was probably having a nervous breakdown, but at the time it didn't look like that. He, he had to, I was at an old, it was a Catholic school, a Jesuit school, and um, art wasn't valued in the school. So the junior school children were in a classroom at the same time as the secondary school children, and one teacher, he could not control the class. So what he did was he'd pick on a junior child to stand on the centre of the table and keep his leg up for as long as possible. And should he ever put his leg down, then that gave him license to punch that child. And he'd get them up against the wall and you know, go to punch them. And one little boy you know, had stood on the table, couldn't keep his leg up any longer. It came down and so the teacher had him up against the wall about to punch him. And I could see the pee running down the side of this little boy's leg. He was so scared. And I couldn't bear it, so I punched the teacher instead. And laid him out completely flat. Um, and I thought, <laughs> 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 it's amazing what strength you find. <laughs> but half an hour later, I was outside the school gates. Yeah. Um, and of course, nobody would listen to me. <laughs> this, this was a school that was very much power driven. It was a few at the top who were driving, you know, absolutely everything else that was going on. Children certainly weren't allowed to voice anything, certainly were not allowed to punch a teacher. Uh, but what I was doing was I was standing up for, for what I believed was, you know, wrong. And I, and I refused to accept it. I, I just said, no, I'm not having this. I didn't think it through, <laughs> clearly. And I wouldn't recommend it as a course of action because it, it had a kind of a counter effect. You know, I ended up outside the gates anyway. And, I, I'm sure he continued his behaviour for quite a time after that. Um, but what I did do was that I, I worked out that it, it wasn't getting me very far using fists to fight for what I believed in, and that maybe I should start using words. And so, in a way, it was no coincidence that I'd end up going on to become a lawyer. And something inside me always resonated with the underdog, <laughs> in a way. And somehow we've ended up now with the planet being you know, a really big underdog here, where there's vast damage and destruction happening on a daily basis. And that, that was a journey that I kind of lost sight of. Do you want to come and join us? Yeah! I kind of lost sight of for a while. Um, so you sort of dip in and out of things in a way. And also because there wasn't any really identifiable sort of environmental movement. 
mm. when I was a teenager or, or anything going on. This is some kind of community oriented thing now. The wonder of Facebook is just so truly remarkable and, and the internet that we can access information at a rate we never could do when you know, I was your age. And it is so fantastic to see how we can actually connect with people and communities right across the world now and disseminate ideas really, really fast. So what I did was I actually ended up becoming a lawyer, but it, it took me about eight, ten years until I literally got to that point of thinking, you know, this really isn't working for me. And I was making an awful lot of money. I, I was punching above my weight. I, I was doing hugely, huge cases that normally someone of my level wouldn't be doing. I was actually very good at what I was doing. And I was a corporate lawyer, I was a corporate barrister. I was in court and I was doing, dealing with employment law, whistleblowing cases, discrimination cases. And I was also representing corporations and recognizing that, you know, there were good people within these corporations, but there was a huge sense of disconnect, and especially corporations that were involved in profiteering out of destroying the planet. And how could that be that this was going on, that people were actually making an awful lot of money out of something that was really damaging and destructive? And for me, that, that just did not make sense. I was explaining earlier today how I literally I got to the stage where one day I was, I was looking out of a court window after dealing with a, a long, great case and literally got to the stage where I looked out and just thought, what the fuck am I doing? You know, I, I care so much more about what's going out there. And this can't be right. You know, we have this whole body of law that's supposed to protect the planet, to protect the earth, the environmental law, and it's all lots of, lots of law. And it's clearly not working. Because, you know, the Amazon's been destroyed at an ever-increasing rate, so, you know, law is just not working. Why is that? And it, it was one of those sort of moments for me when I really thought, you know, the earth is in need of a good lawyer. And it's just not happening the way we've got a system set up at the moment. Environmental law is not protecting the earth. It's protecting big business. So that took me on a journey that I thought I'd take a year out to work out, and that was nearly eight years ago. But it's quite clear that I'm never going to go back to a normal job now, as I was explaining to my bank manager quite recently, trying to justify why I'm never going to have the income I want to have. <laughs> I, it, it's, it's one of these things that when you go down a rabbit hole, sometimes your life can change very dramatically, because you, you're always sort of saying, I'm up for the ride. I'm willing to take the step into the unknown and see where it takes me. And I'm willing to do this because I see myself in service to a greater good. And actually, that is the way I see the way I'm working. That I'm just a messenger, really. And I'm putting my own skill base to good use. It just so happens that my skill base is as a lawyer. Um, and I actually got to appoint a particular type of lawyer. I was a barrister, so I was used to having the tools of my trade to be able to go into court and do things. And so I was recognising I don't have the tools to represent Earth in the courtroom. Environmental law is not fit for purpose, it's not working, it's, it's, it's not protecting the Earth, so that doesn't work. We need some far better tools here. And you know, if we don't have them, what is it that we need? And who's going to be out there working out what we need? And once we've worked out what we need, who's going to start creating the new laws? So in a way, it was a recognition, well, no one else is doing this. Well, I'd better do it. Until I can encourage others to come on board and start doing the same thing as well. Because also, it's not about one person. This is about many, many people. And it's a recognition that it takes lots of people from lots of different fields and lots of different arenas with lots of different skills from lots of different backgrounds. But actually all of us just coming from the same simple premise that life is sacred. And once we start working from that premise, everything changes really. Uh, and for me it's actually three things, and I was explaining this earlier. Life is sacred. 
Um, we are all one. We're all interconnected. We're all interdependent. You know, I, I grew up with um, being told that bees were bad things. You know, kill them. They, they, they sting you. You don't, you don't want to be near you. You eh, go running from it. Now I really understand that bees are very, very sacred indeed. And here we have colony collapse disorder happening right across the world. Lose our bees and we lose 70% of our foodstuffs overnight. Now, a very instructive report came out last year, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, where there was number crunching done on eco-services, ecosystem services. And there, in that report, it actually gave a figure for how much it would cost us if we lost all of our bees for a year. Now that's instructive because it, it lets us know how big the problem is. But actually, no amount of money is going to replace the bees. Once we lose the capacity for bees to be there to pollinate, we lose our foodstuffs. They're all in. And I know no leader in the world that can pollinate like a bee can. So bees are really very precious, really very sacred. And it's not because there's a price tag on them. In fact, it's beyond price. It, it, they, are, they have value in and of themselves. And it's not just bees, it's all species. We might not really understand the true value of a slug yet, but <laughs> you know, I think there's a campaign to be had to love a slug. <laughs> so many people malign slugs and you know, kill them and throw pesticides and chemicals on them. There is a reason we have slugs in this world. We just haven't worked it out. And likewise for many, many other species. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it is that interconnectedness of life. And that really it's about fostering life, biodiversity in all its forms, even if we don't really understand the true value. I often think that when we have um, an excess of one particular species, that all it's doing is indicating that there's an imbalance in the process. And we are one species that's in excess at the moment, ironically. But when I was in New Zealand uh, just 10 days ago, one of their hidden ecocides is the use of 1080 chemical spray. They actually spray it from uh, the skies by helicopters. And they spray and throw uh, pellets right across vast tracts of land and, and forest to keep the possum numbers down. And a report came out three weeks ago, issued by the government, justifying the use of 1080 spray and coming to the conclusion that it was an absolute necessity, even, even though it kills off a heck of a lot of other things en route and washes into waterways. And there's even evidence now, medical, uh, scientific evidence, to show that the, the crops themselves, the, the plants, are actually now bringing 1080 into their own systems. So it's become so embedded in their landscape. Now, the figures that that report relied on were 1970s figures. And as a lawyer, I go back to first premises, first assumptions. There were some assumptions there. There's an assumption that they have a possum plague. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows if they do have a possum plague, actually. Nobody's taking numbers. And 20 years of using this chemical. Well, if it hasn't gotten rid of the possums now, then maybe we shouldn't be using it in any event. And in fact, as the government signed up huge long-term contracts for this to be used, why is this going on? It seems that there is this kind of mad ecocide that's been bought into and normalized under the law of contract. And this is what seems to happen is that we normalize things and we see it, you know, as well, that's the way the world is, that's the reality, so there's nothing we can do. Let's be reasonable about it. You know, that's just the world, that's the way it is. Reasonable people don't change the world. They accept the world it is. But when you accept the world as it is, then all you do is you create more of what is. It's by refusing to accept the norms, questioning them, and saying just because it's the norm doesn't mean it's right, that you then start changing the world. You start changing the world around you, 
And that then in turn creates massive ripples that go out wider and wider and wider, right across the universe in fact. We often don't know how powerful it is just by setting our intent. By setting my intent that day in court when I looked out the window and decided that I would become the Earth's lawyer, I'm now here where I am and my job's not done yet. And I won't stop until the job is done, or until others come on board and I, I can step away quite happily. And that's what happens, because actually that's the wonder of it. There's so much now that we can even do just from our fingertips, you know, just even online, um, just by even within our own community, and by engaging, by standing up against something, by making that stance. Sometimes it just takes one person to stand up and say, the emperor has no clothes on, and things start changing. Eva Morales, who's the president of Bolivia, he did that this year, uh, well last year in, in December, at the climate negotiations, where the red negotiations, this is about creating carbon markets over forests. He stood up and he said, this is governmental ecocide. He's right, it is. And he was the only one that spoke out. I ended up on the plane coming back from those climate negotiations with one of the negotiators, just by chance, sitting beside me. And my conversation with her was really illuminating because as far as she was concerned, that was irresponsible of him to speak out. A truth. But we shouldn't be telling the public that. Now, 22 countries have now come on board with Eva Morales and said they support his stance. And I suspect by the time we get to the, the climate negotiations in Durban, which I'm going to this December, we'll find that you know, there's going to be a larger voice there. But what it needed was one man within the system to start standing up. And these people that stand within the system and stand up are often catalysts. And it's not just in the international arena this happens, it happens also at a community level. You know, the standing up and saying this is wrong can change everything. I didn't know it when I was at my school and I stood up and I punched the art teacher. But actually what that did was that it did stop his violence against the students, the school kids, and he wasn't allowed to continue with it. I didn't know that, I wasn't in the school after it. But it did stop something, ultimately. I didn't know. I felt as if I was the pariah. I was sent to another school after that. My parents thought I was a complete lost cause. <laughs> you know, they just believed that I'd stepped out of line. But stepping out of line is precisely what's actually needed right now. This is about taking action and standing up for what we believe in. And I mentioned this earlier, this is rather like being a lighthouse. You know, when all around us the storm rages. Well, the storm does subside. And when it subsides, it is the lighthouse that's still there the next day when the sunrise comes up. And kind of what's happening in the world at large at the moment is that we have a huge storm raging politically, within corporations, within massive kind of fights that are being played out in the international arena. Are we going to just commoditize the planet so that more corporations can make more money out of damaging and destroying the earth? Or are those a few people that stand up and say, no, this is wrong, this is not the way we want to do it? Are they the ones that will be standing after the storm finally dies down? And I genuinely believe that that's what it's about. And actually, you don't need that many lighthouses. That's the beauty of it. You get a lot of noise happening all around. And a lot of what we're hearing in the media as well, in news, is just noise. It's, it's kind of the radar clutter, you know? It's just negative news, fear-driven. You know, it can, it can scare you into doing nothing, quite frankly. But if you just stand back for a moment and say, well, actually, what matters here? What really matters? What matters to me in my world, in my community? What is it that I really want to happen here? And just start from your world and stand up and say, this is what I want to see happen here. By voicing, there's something that happens when you voice an intent. Not just keep it in your head, but share it with someone. Speak out, speak it out loud, and engage and start a dialogue and 
you know, one or two people come together, then you know, things start happening. Really, the world starts changing around us. Everywhere I go, I'm meeting people like you. It's brilliant. Because actually what it makes me realise is that there are loads and loads of people throughout the world who think like me. And that's, that's just magic. That really is because we cede it to each other. We cross-fertilise. Um, Stuart was talking about this. Pollination. <laughs> cross-pollination. We feed ideas. We, we seed it out. What I'm doing is I'm seeding out a jolly good idea. And I'm taking it at a top level, but also I'm taking it at the bottom. Because two things have to happen here. The two have to converge. It's not just actually about getting engagement at the political top arena, but it's about getting people, people to actually start speaking out and calling upon governments as well. Because that gives governments permission to act. Without pressure, governments aren't going to be able to act on this. And so what I'm doing is I'm literally asking people to come on board and, and help me make ecocide a crime. At the end of the day, this is dead easy. It is literally just simply an amendment to an existing legal document. It's called the Rome Statute. It puts in place the four international crimes against peace. They are like umbrella laws that cover the whole of the world. It only needs 81 signatures. That's 81 heads of state to sign this to get it made into law. That's actually quite easy. If we look at the whole of South America's gearing up around Mother Earth rights, we'll get them on board with Ecocide. Small island nations, they'll come on board because they're the ones that are most at risk of being adversely affected and impacted by naturally occurring Ecocide. Because Ecocide isn't just corporate Ecocide, it's not just damage and destruction by ExxonMobil. It's damage and destruction that happens out of catastrophic events, rising sea levels, tsunamis, tornadoes, volcanic, volcanic activity, anything that puts a given territory uh, at risk of mass damage and destruction or loss of ecosystems. Now at the moment, Kiribati and, and the Maldives are standing there saying, we're going to go underwater in 15 years. That's ecocide, you know, it's rising sea levels, it, it washes them out completely completely gets rid of their ecosystems, their, their biodiversity, not just people. And nobody's helping them. Not one country has any legal duty of care to assist. By creating the international law of ecocide, it imposes a legal duty of care on all nations to assist. And this is about my second principle that guides me, that we are all one, we're all interconnected, we're all interdependent. So when something goes wrong over there, then all of us need to be assisting. Not just the nearest country, who might themselves actually be in a position where they're finding it very difficult to assist anyway. And so when we all start coming together and saying, OK, now we have a legal duty of care, which is just a written form of saying we recognise our, our fiduciary duty of care. And we recognise it inherently in and of itself that we need to help here then something really remarkable happens because then we start helping each other, not fighting against each other. We actually start looking at peaceful solutions rather than going at war against each other, saying, okay, we need to do land grabs because we're going to have water shortages here and we're going to have rare mineral resources shortages here, so we want to grab that here and we're going to sell this off there and we're going to sell this to the Chinese because they want our water. None of that. We then start looking at it from a process of actually caring and sharing. And that's very, very important. It's a different paradigm. For me, it's a new paradigm. For me, this is about stepping into the new world, where instead of it being about competition, it's about collaboration, uh, communication, cooperation. Uh, instead of taking, it's about giving. It's, it's about life instead of death, because ultimately at the moment what we're doing is literally we're just damaging and destroying the earth, which leads to conflict, it leads to um, limited resources, and that leads to war. 
which leads to more damage and destruction, which leads to more resource depletion, which leads to more war, and we start spiralling out of control here. And it's not about slowing that down, it's about cutting it, literally cutting that cycle of damage and destruction. And this is why ecocide is called a crime against peace. Because ultimately, once we stop damaging and destroying the very earth that we stand on, we stop damaging and destroying our own habitats, we stop damaging and destroying our own beings, then we can enter into a world where peace truly is possible. I call this the missing fifth crime against peace, because although we already have genocide as a crime, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes of aggression, which is the run-up to war, and this is a nonsense that actually we can legalise war, but that aside, these are really about protecting the sacredness of life, mainly human life. And what I'm saying is we extend the cycle out. It's not just about human-to-human -human relationships. It's about the relationship with the wider Earth, the wider world, our ecosystems, because of our interconnectedness. So we extend that cycle, and therefore we make a crime the vast damage and destruction to ecosystems. So it's about closing that door. But it's also about closing the door quickly and easily. And we've got a window of opportunity. We're working out that existing systems that we've tried to put in place to help protect the earth aren't working. Environmental law doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's based on two things. It's based on permits. So with environmental laws, we, we give permits to corporations to continue polluting, permits to pollute. So ask the question, whose interests are being protected here? Not the earth, but the polluter is, because they've been given a permit. What happens then is that you end up with something called Jevons Paradox. Actually, by giving out permits, more pollution happens because you just keep on giving out even more permits. Uh, we see it with car manufacturers. We say, okay, um, we'll limit to a limited degree um, the amount of fossil fuel you're using in your systems, you know, to make it more energy efficient. I uh, will have cars that run for a limited duration and something else and then it kicks into that. Well, all you're doing by limiting it is actually you're encouraging people to feel that, oh, we've got a more energy efficient car, well, we can drive further, we can buy more cars. And actually, the dark is with innovation in a completely different direction. We will have cars that don't run in fossil fuel. It's not the car so much the problem, it's the fossil fuel. It's where it's coming from. And this is the thing. You know, we may end up in the future with cars that can fly. That's not so wild. In fact, the EU has just put in 4 billion euros into research into this. It's a matter of when, not if. Cars that can fly, that is wild. That's great. And not on fossil fuel either. They're looking at it and run on solar. Just how do you govern the skies? You have people like Stuart without proper licences driving them. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be great? It would be really good fun. So interesting things can happen. And actually we can turn these keys really relatively fast. My father was born in 1917. He married very late. He was actually 48 when he married my mother. He was 24, half his age. Um, and he was, I think, 52 when he had me. I, and my father went from growing up in Ireland as a little boy in horse and cart and then he came over to Scotland and he saw cars for the first time. He um, saw and went on a plane for the first time. And first time, he lived through a lifetime where that had never been done before. He saw the man land on the moon. He saw that picture of the earth that we now know that happened for the first time when Yuri Gagarin went up on a rocket, Vostok uh, I think it was called, uh, and, and saw the earth, that image that now we see everywhere. That happened in my father's lifetime. In fact, by the time he died 12 years ago, mobile phones were just arriving. In his lifetime, he saw changes that he could not even begin to contemplate happening in his lifetime. Think what's going to happen by the end of our lifetime. And how magic that is. Such great things can happen. Because actually change happens all the time. We evolve and move on. Whatever we put intent into, we can start manifesting. Because actually, 
Inventions are just a physical manifestation of a jolly good idea somewhere along the line. A couple of years ago I started to look at tipping points. I was very interested in, you know, just how many people do you need to get on board, how fast do tipping points happen. And I looked at the 20th century. And I, I looked at the beginning of the 20th century, the 1900s. What, what, was, what was the big uptake of a jolly good idea then? Because I'm very interested to find out how quickly can I get my jolly good ideas to become a reality? You know, how, how quickly can I get Ecoside made an international crime? Now, take a jolly good idea and make it reality. And so I looked at uptake of technology, because that's just a physical manifestation of a jolly good idea. Someone somewhere has a light bulb moment and goes, I know. Telecommunications, wouldn't it be great if I could pick up something and speak to my granny over there? Someone really did think that up at the beginning of the, you know, the 20th century. And it's really interesting because that took 38 years until it took off and started. Actually, there are graphs that show, you know, that gets to a point and then boom, you know, there's, there's a discernible point where it starts taking off quite fast. The mid 20th century, one of the big uptakes then was washing machines. <laughs> that took 26 or 28 years, and literally it was again, you know, there and then boom, you could see it started taking off in quite a big way. At the end of the 20th century, mobile phones, 12 years and then boom. And what's more, you know, every time it's doom, it's going steeper and faster each time. Now we're in the 21st century. You know, it's a far smaller percentage and far quicker than it goes, and it goes really quickly. And so I started kind of thinking, okay, like, hey, you know, here I am. Actually, I'm trying to create the international crime to protect the Earth's right to life. How long can it take for this to take off, and how many people do I need to get on board? Now, it, it's said that really now all we need is 1% of the world's population to really believe in something that will happen very, very quickly. But let's be really conservative. Let's go for that 12% that it was needed for mobile phones. And this is great, because when I started looking at this and thinking, OK, now, Earth, uh, Mother Earth rights, which is what the International Crime of Ecoside is doing, it's protecting the Earth right to life, just as your right to life is protected on a one-to-one -one level by the crime of murder or homicide, and on an industrial level by the crime of genocide. So we're looking at the Mother Earth right to life being protected by the international crime of genocide. So how long is it going to take until we have a universal declaration of the rights of Mother Earth and an international crime of genocide in place? The two go hand in hand. How many people are we going to need to get on board? Well, what's 12%? Well, this is interesting. Because we've already got 370 million uh, people, indigenous people out there in the world. People who are defined by the UN as living indigenously off their land as their forebears have. Successfully living off their land. That's not to say that all indigenous communities are necessarily successful. Of course not. We're not quite in that perfect world. But it's a heck of a lot of people who, who are identified as kind of living as their forebears did and not living by written laws, living by natural laws. People who already believe in you know, Earth's rights, uh, who already understand these ideas, well that's 370 million people already. Brilliant. Okay, so that's quite a big figure. Buddhists, well they get this whole idea that we shouldn't be destroying the Earth and that actually the Earth has rights too. That's something they inherently understand. I was talking to one of the Dalai Lama's right-hand men, which was great, um, at the World Peace Conference, where I was speaking in Berlin just a couple of weeks ago before I came over to New Zealand. Buddhists really get what I'm saying, and I'm very engaged in connecting with the Buddhist community about this. That's another 380 million people who already get this idea who are already living it, it's just part of their way of being, codifying this into, into international law, well, we already get that we're there. That's 380 million people, so that's 750 million people already. Well, if we're looking at close on 7 billion people in the world, 750 million, well, actually, 
gosh, we're at the 10%, 11% already. Really only looking at another couple of percent coming on board with these ideas, if that. And when you start talking to people who are you know, deep greenies, environmentalists, activists, spiritually engaged, permies, you know, people who are engaging in protecting the earth one way or another, fighting their fight, activists. And it's kind of a strange anomaly that you know, the media portrays activists as people who want to destroy the earth. On the contrary, these are people who care deeply about the earth. Then in fact, you haven't got that many people to get on board at all to create this change and create it and make it happen very, very quickly. And I do genuinely believe that the next 18 months are going to be really exciting. I think they're already very exciting. And that we have a window of opportunity here. The Earth Summit is one of those potentially important moments in time that something big like this can be seeded in. So the Earth Summit's happening in, in Rio next June, June, 20 years after the original one. I, originally, 20 years ago, it was recognised by governments around the world. Something's going wrong with the Earth, we'd better have a summit about it, you know, get leaders around the table. But it kind of got derailed. Um, I think possibly with the best intentions, but it got derailed in part by a new word that had been brought into um, use at that time. It, it was a book that had come out just before the Earth Summit and, and had gone quite big. And it, it, it was a word that kind of went into public consciousness really quite fast. That word was stakeholder. And the question was asked, well, who's the stakeholder for the Earth? And the answer came back, business. <laughs> So business was invited to the table. What wasn't recognised is that actually it's multi-stakeholder engagement. It's not just business that as, as, is a stakeholder in this. We have the indigenous world. We have children. We have future generations. We have the people. Most importantly of all, we have the earth. But that wasn't understood 19 years ago at the Earth Summit. And what happened was, was that there were really big ideas on the table back then. It's quite hard to find out about this because actually we didn't have the internet then, so not so much of this is recorded on the internet. You kind of have to search amongst documents that you know, aren't up there. But what was very interesting when I did research on this was to discover that there were actually international laws proposed and on the table to stop vast damage and destruction to the earth. And the number one stakeholder that was invited to the table said, you don't want to make a law, let's keep it voluntary. In fact, one of the things that was on the table was something that's become a massive catchword now, corporate social responsibility. That was actually going to become international law, but it wasn't, it was voluntary. Now we have this huge voluntary engagement around CSR, which has become a kind of mixed bag. It's a way of messaging an awful lot of good stuff which may only go surface deep. And actually often if you dig into it, it is a bit of greenwash here, and maybe some good intent there, but it doesn't really follow through completely. One of the things that was on the table 19 years ago was an international court for the environment. That just got completely wiped off it. But also one of the things that was on the table was, why don't we start some form of market to solve this problem? So why don't we put something in place called the climate negotiations? That was born out of the Earth Summit. And the idea being that it had to be market driven for business, so that they could make money out of this, so that we could actually provide something that was money making, because the market could solve this. This is what business was saying, we'll make a business out of it. Yeah. If we make a good enough business, we can solve the problem. Well, we've had 19 years of that, of the Kyoto Protocol, clean development mechanism, 
creating carbon trading mechanisms, offsetting our trading systems. And we know they don't work. We've tried it. It doesn't work. So we've got a, a window of opportunity here to say, okay, we tried that. It didn't work. And we didn't quite understand back then that, in fact, it's multi-stakeholder engagement. And stakeholders that really are very important here. One of the biggest problems was that by putting in place the climate negotiations, we put in a system that everyone thinks is the norm. Climate negotiations are built on consensus, where each country can bring as many negotiators to the table as they want. So, the Maldives have five. America has 500. And when it's consensus right across the board and it's on the basis of all negotiators having to agree, you get huge power imbalances. And you've got 500 negotiators saying, we want this, and five saying, we want this. 500 wins. So we've got a system in place that we think is the norm, just because it's been running now for 17 years. But in fact, it's not working. It's collapsing. Now, I know as a lawyer who, when I first started out in court, who dealt with ancillary relief proceedings, which is divorce proceedings, trying to get two people to agree to something is really hard. When it's 2000, <laughs> it's nigh on impossible. And what you end up coming out with is the kind of the, the lowest common denominator, which is what happened in Copenhagen. But in a way, that was maybe a very good thing because I read what was the, the uh, Copenhagen Accord before um, it, it collapsed, and it was 94 pages. And it was 94 pages of conflicting voices arguing over how to create market mechanisms and property and ownership over forests, over land, over carbon markets. Now, in Cancun negotiations last year, I heard the president of Walmart take a stage with Ban Ki-moon, the head of the United Nations, and him standing there and declaring that he was an environmentalist. And he, he got huge round of applause for that from a lot of the negotiators. And he said the most exciting thing about creating markets where we can create property and ownership over forests is that it's just one step away from being able to create markets out of the DNA of the indigenous people who live in those forests. Uh, it's very chilling. Property and ownership. So the thing is, is that actually, I'd kind of like to show you something here. It's a slide I use, and I'll put it up about this, because it is about the different paradigms that we're in. Um, and climate negotiations is really stuck in a paradigm that isn't working. And it's actually a good thing that we have collapse. Because when we have collapse, it's just as Mother Nature does. It allows us then to bring in from the margins very fast the new. Mother Nature creates her own collapse, forest fires, gets rid of the dead wood. And that makes way then for the new growth to come up. So although it seemed very disempowering to actually have collapse of climate negotiations, in truth, it's actually a very good thing. Now, this is, I don't know if you can see this, um, two different approaches, two different paradigms. This is about how you view the Earth. View the Earth as a living being. And what you do is you take responsibility. You recognise that you owe a duty of care to the earth. But view the earth as an inert thing. And what you do is you commoditise it. You put a price on it. You buy it, you sell it, you use it, you abuse it. That's all about property laws. That's about I own. That's about ownership. So here, this is what I call the old paradigm. This is all about property. This is all about law, law of property, law of contract. The scales of justice have become so imbalanced here. And actually nature tends to do her own realigning sometimes. The external disruptors that sometimes happen. 
but we can create our own internal disruptors as well by creating bridges to the new paradigm. And that, one of the ways of doing that is rectifying the legal imbalance by putting in place laws that are arising out of intrinsic values, out of this space, that are about trusteeship, guardianship, stewardship, not ownership, not about I own, but instead I owe a duty of care. And that's what ecocide is about. It's, it's an international crime that imposes a legal duty of care on nations, on corporations. It's about putting in place a preemptive obligation. Think before you act. I'm not going to go there because actually I'll be imprisoned if I go there. Because it's a crime. Crime attaches itself to people. At the moment, environmental law has nothing to do with people. All it does is that you can litigate against the fictional person the corporation, it's no good. That just means a corporation can pay a fine, litigate, or close their doors and open up tomorrow under another name and sidestep it. That's what happens with the Amazon. We've got illegal logging happening at large, just factored in as an externality. We'll get caught once in a hundred times. So you go down and buy some furniture, garden furniture in the garden store, if you don't know if it's FSC accredited, then it may well be from illegal logging from the Amazon. You're just paying a little extra to cover their fines should they get caught and business continues as usual. But create an international crime and you close the door. Because suddenly that CEO of the, those eight directors, that head of the bank that's financing it, that head of government can go to prison for what they're doing. And that is very, very powerful. Now, I was telling the group earlier that last year I was at um, Royal Bank of Scotland I, at the AGM up in Edinburgh. Royal, Royal Bank of Scotland was a, a national bank that went really big over a period of seven years, largely investing in toxic assets and then went nearly bust overnight as well. But the British government um, shored them up to a huge amount of money. Actually, it was the taxpayer's money, so it's, it's now 84% owned by the taxpayer. So it's become the People's Bank. It doesn't act like the People's Bank, but it is the People's Bank. Um, only they don't seem to realise it yet. And so their AGM last year was going to be the first one as the People's Bank, and a lot of people went up there you know, to speak at, at it. There was a, a guy, he's a documentary maker, and he asked a very good question at it. He asked, why is it that you're investing my money, the people's money, millions and millions of pounds in damaging and disruptive ecocidal activity. And he was, he was talking specifically about particular mining. And the CEO of the bank sat back and he laughed. And actually half the audience laughed with him. And he said, well, hey, <laughs> it's not a crime. And for me, that was a really telling moment because it is a crime. Morally, it is a crime. It's just not a crime in law yet. And it's that thing where, in and of itself, it is wrong. What's known in ancient Latin, Latin, which is ancient, malum in se, in and, in and of itself it is wrong. And what we do, when we recognise something as malum and say, is we create malum prohibitor. We therefore close the door to it and we prohibit it, and we make it a crime. And so it is that thing of changing, shifting norms. For him, it's the norm that is perfectly acceptable through the law of contract, through the law of property, that we can invest in damaging, disruptive activity. Close the door to it and make the crime. It will no longer be the norm. What will literally happen is that there will be a very different conversation where that, that young man could ask him, why is it you're no longer investing in damaging, disruptive activity? And he'll sit back and he'll laugh and say, well, <laughs> it's a crime. I'm not going there. And that's the power of international criminal law, that literally you turn off the tap upstream so that the flow of money does not go into the damage and destruction. And instead it can flow into innovation in another direction. Because flow of money is just a flow of energy in a physical form. 
It can flow into toxic, uh, stagnant pools. In fact, in fact, keeping your money and shoring it up and keeping it in, in banks creates stagnant. It's like water. It's, it, it, it doesn't go to any good use. But let your money flow into the good stuff. And actually what you do is you nourish life itself. Put it into the community projects. Put it into life itself. And what you see is life starts flourishing. Life starts growing. Innovation in quite a different direction happens altogether. I also wanted to tell you about the Luz Plateau because the Luz Plateau is a remarkable story in its own right, which was really about putting in place principles of biodiversity. The Luz Plateau is in the centre of China. If you take a map of China and literally stick your finger in the middle, that's where the Luz Plateau is. The Luz Plateau is the size of England and Wales. It's 45,000 square kilometres. So it's a big area. I probably guess it's the size of Queensland, actually. Um, I'm not sure how... Queensland seems to be absolutely huge to me, so... Maybe, maybe... Uh, Queensland's probably even... Um, <laughs> big. We're still going to be big here. Yeah, but Queensland's probably far bigger. <laughs> Australia's huge. <laughs> you know, I looked on the map and thought, OK, it'll take me an hour to maybe get over to New Zealand. Maybe a bit of Tasmania, a bit of Victoria. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Queensland will be at least, I think at least six times that size. Wow, yeah, really? So. Oh my god. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking one six, six Queensland. Because it's like 2,000 kilometres by at least, what, 1,000? Mm. Oh, really? Across, so that's 2 million square kilometres. Okay, right, right so probably yeah. it's about a six of it. It's a big area nonetheless. You have to, you know, to fly over, it takes over an hour. Now, the Luz Plateau was one, one of the most hostile terrains on the whole of the planet. And if you see photographs of it from earlier days, it, it, it really is a, an area of land that just looked like kind of a moonscape. And it, 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 it really was subsistence farming that was going on there. Peasants with goats, because goats were the only thing that could survive. They could literally, you know, go up mountains and find the last vestige of something and, you know, eke it out and eat it and get it out of the ground. Uh, and one of the biggest problems was that um, you know, because it really was subsistence farming, mal mal malnutrition was very high, children were dying off at a young age, women were giving birth at a, 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 an incredible rate partly because they were losing the children quite fast and they needed the children to be out there chasing for the goats. And, you know, they got caught in this terrible cycle of death and more death happening. I, and one of the biggest problems they had was that they get huge torrential downpours. And when they had this, literally it would wash the sand, it, it was a desert, you know, it would wash these sands for thousands of kilometres downstream, sometimes actually wiping out huge communities and just literally washing mud and silt all the way down. And then it would all dry and then you get huge winds and you get that dust bowl effect that China still has problems with in various areas of China. So the Chinese government decided, okay, we need to, we need to stop this, this dust bowl effect. We're going to go into the Liz Plateau and we're going to create a green oasis. We're literally we're going to go in and green the desert because if we do that, we're going to stop the dust and the dirt. So they went upstream basically and said, okay, if we stop it up here, then we stop the problems downstream over here. And to do that, they recognised that in fact this was a huge exercise and they kind of needed the green army to come in. Well, their green army was on the ground. It was these subsistence farmers and the peasants. And they said, okay, we need your help with this, and we need to get rid of actually what's really eating the last vestiges of what's keeping the land here, you know, from ever thriving. That's your goats. We're going to lock up your goats. And China being China doesn't do consultation process. <laughs> <laughs> you know, literally went in there and said, okay, we're going to curtail your goats. We're going to keep them downstream. We're going to keep them on lower regions. And we're going to actually zone the land. 
So we're going to have agricultural land as one third of the area at the lower reaching levels, the levels that we used to get to, and then two thirds of it's going to be ecological zones. Now, of course, the local people said, you can't do that. We need all this land for our goats because there's so little out there. And they had huge problems trying to convince the people, look, what we're going to do is we're going to get you to help us green the land up here and it will help you down here. If you help us with the ecological zone, you know, you will get what you need in the agricultural zone. And the people couldn't get their head around this. So they did a deal and they said, okay, we're going to give you tenureship of your land. Whatever you manage to grow down, down, down in the lower regions, it's yours. But we really need you to green up here to help us do this. So the people said, okay, we're going to do this. And what they needed them to do was to go in and...